Yep, just uh, happy to be back home, happy the students are back on campus, and uh, look forward to playing Vanderbilt on Wednesday. The people on Twitter wanted to know the story behind these shirts that you've been wearing. Like, is that some kind of deal that you've got, or just for fun because you know it's you know associated with Arkansas? That's a good question, Nikki. A lot of good Twitter stuff, huh? Um, no, it's you know big sponsors, not of me, of Arkansas. <laughs> so I'm just big supporters of Tyson. Just with uh, Vanderbilt and their leading scorer out in Kentucky coming, is there a worry about, you know, You know what, Nikki, do it, maybe I should – sorry to interrupt. Maybe I should – like, are these questions on your Twitter feed? Yeah. So I can – if I – before I walk in here, I probably need to – Okay. All right. <laughs> sorry about that. No, just about with Vanderbilt and their, their leading scorer is hurt, and you got Kentucky Saturday, and obviously teams – fans and everybody look ahead to them. Is that a concern at all? It's a concern just because it was brought up. I mean, we got one thing to worry about, and it's how do we get ready for Wednesday's game. That's it. It's the most important game on our schedule. Um, they played Auburn great the other night on the road. Um, we got to get ready to figure out how to, how to play Vandy. That's plain and simple. Eric, um, is there any analytic you see that speaks to why Isaiah has bigger second halves, score, scores more in the second halves so far? I, I just think he's an unselfish player. And so, uh, you know, I think he lets his teammates get get involved. And, and um, you know, I think for the most part we've kind of been a, you know, a second half team as well. Um, you know, but from a – X and O standpoint, you know, we go to our go-to scores more in the second half. Um, first half, there's a lot of play calls and stuff that are run where five guys are touching the ball and we have a little bit more movement. Um, then the last 10 minutes of the game, you know, we have specific sets with different wrinkles where we're, where we're actually, you know, dictating more, so to speak, who's, who's taking those shots or who has the ball in their hands to make decisions play a little bit against uh, Ole Miss. What did you like, not like, and do you think that we'll see him against Vanderbilt? Um, I don't know if we'll see him more or less or at all or a lot. Or um, He, you know, he rebounded the ball. He had five rebounds in 11 minutes. I think he was one off our leader, and he only played 11 minutes. So we loved uh, J.C.'s activity for sure. Um getting loose balls and and uh I, I think even the game before like he he played like one minute and got a big offensive rebound um so he, he you know he rebounded the ball it's obviously an area of deficiency for us uh having said that you know he's one for four from the foul line and um I think that's just a confidence thing and a rust thing and put that on me because I haven't played him a lot um but certainly we'd like to you know, we went to the bench a little bit quicker, a little bit earlier against uh, Old Miss maybe than, than some other games. And, you know, just kind of depends on the flow of the game and matchups and who you think the other team's going to bring off the bench on what, what we do going forward. And it's probably going to be a game by game and who's in foul trouble or who's not in foul trouble. And, but he, I was happy with how he rebounded. What do you see out of Vanderbilt and kind of what, what – problems do they present? You know, Lee's a really good player, can really score the ball. He's a great athlete. They're power forward, can shoot the basketball. Uh, they're big, had a career night, uh, 12 points, rebounded the ball well. He's a big, strong body. Um, and then obviously Pippen can really get in the lane and um, keeps getting, you know, as a freshman, keeps getting better and better. But but obviously, you know, Saban Lee, I mean, his, his scoring ability and, and uh, you know, we're going to have to to contain him somewhat. And um, those are the things off the top of my head. Isaiah, I think, was shooting under 20% from three in the corners this year before Saturday, and then he went four for four there. Was it just kind of a matter of those shots are going to start eventually falling at some point? Yeah, it's interesting from a, a analytics standpoint uh, in the NBA almost – player for player, team for team, the two corners are the highest. 
Um, and then when you start going foul line extended or free throw line extended or above, the, the percentages drop. <laughs> With our team, for whatever reason, we're the exact opposite. Um, so certainly feel like not just Isaiah, but any of our guys, we feel like those corner threes, uh, we should be able to hit it, a, you know, at a higher percentage and will just based on, you know, playing more games and it kind of all evens out at the end of the day. Um, but yeah, we've been a little bit shocked with how well we've shot it from above the uh, foul line extended and out and, and surprised how, how we haven't hit it at a high clip in the corners. What's your um, background with uh, Stackhouse? Have you had a lot of crossing over with him? Uh, yeah, his, 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 uh, his brother, Tony Dawson, I coached actually um, in Rapid City. Tony is, uh, in my opinion, was probably the best scorer in the last 25 years that I've seen in minor league basketball did not that did not play in the NBA. Um, Tony played at Florida State, and um, just through Tony, just you know, obviously Stack when he when he played was known as an incredible competitor. Obviously, you know his scoring speaks for itself. But anybody in the in, inner circles of of uh, you know of the NBA knows what a competitor he was and how hard he played. Shift gears a little bit here. I'm doing a story on Jimmy Witt for the AP, and uh, kind of wondering about your relationship with him, and and kind of the leadership that he's been able to bring the team, having kind of been around the block, so to speak. Yeah, I mean, I love coaching Jimmy. He, um, I got another text this morning. You know, like what, what, what do we see as a staff that we can help him? Um, you know, he's. He's just so important for us because he inverts our offense, meaning he roams the baseline and plays like a, a center or a power forward at times for us offensively. Then there's other times where he's out handling the ball like to start games and he's running our offense. And every night, no matter who the best point guard, off guard, small forward, or power forward is, he's guarded one through four. We go back to Indiana when he's guarding – um, they're, they're, they're best interior player for the entire first half. Um, you know, he was guarding Tyree the other night, the entire game against Old Miss, and then we changed up our defensive philosophy and had him face guard the last basically eight minutes of the game. Um, he's in the gym all the time working on little things like his free throw shooting. Um, cerebral player, uh, great teammate. And somebody that's just really easy to be around. We just got our academic grades back. He did really well there too. <laughs> I don't think he's attempted a three-point shot yet. Is that by he design? Won't. Are you uh, when he gets his hands on the ball? Are you screaming, "Don't, don't shoot it, don't shoot it," or anything like that? Or just it's just yeah, not part of his game. Yeah, it's just not. That's he's a mid-range shooter and a and you know you always want your players to have great shot selection. He's got incredible shot selection. He just he knows who he is. And, uh, you know, usually at this level, what you're trying to do is you're trying to convince each guy who they are, what they do well, understanding um, themselves, you know, as a player. And he, he's one guy like we don't <laughs> – he knows who he is. Um, you know, but it's, 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 it's a neat story when you think about a player coming back to a place that he started his career and then – you know, I mean, he, he, he was in a good situation at SMU. I mean, he was playing a lot of minutes. And, uh, you know, that's one of, you know, concern if you, if you have a transfer or a grad transfer and a guy's had a really good role, played for a really good coach, um, you know, all those type of things, was at a really good school. Um, I mean, his mom told me, like, this better work out or she's coming to get me. Um, she made it very clear she's from New York and she she came straight at me in the recruiting process I was curious about your deficient uh, defensive efficiency up to the point it was 49 38 the other night and then what ch changed for the rest of the game how'd you come back from a defensive standpoint we we changed how we were guarding um, we face guarded Tyree which then turn the game into a four-on-four four game. We really haven't face-guarded anybody all year. Um, 
And then we trapped both their guards um, with Desi. Desi just left his man, and that's called a, a shadow if it's in the back court or a hit in the front court. And we did that the final eight minutes. It worked out good, and then my wife was at, in St. Louis at a dance rehearsal with my daughter, and I told her that story, and she said, that's great. Why were you so dumb to wait until the last eight minutes to do that? So we thought it was good strategically until I talked to Danielle, and she actually told me that you're a moron, and why did you not do that the first 40 minutes? You commented a little bit on Vandy from the other night. How, how are they different a little bit without Neesmith in there? I mean, I think everybody's different with, without um, – you know, if a player gets in foul trouble, if Isaiah's in foul trouble for us, if Mace is in foul, like the whole identity changes a little bit. Um, but having said that, you know, it opens up other opportunities for other people. So, um, you know, the night that Mason couldn't play for us, somebody else got his shots, you know. And so, you know, I mean, somebody's going to get – his shots and some of those shots are going to go in that's just you know that's just the nature of you're not going to lose possessions because you because you don't have a player out there you you're still going to have your possessions you're going to have your attempts but obviously he's a really special player um in a really difficult matchup you know having said that I mean the only thing we're really concerned with is you know who we have to play against on on Wednesday and and um they're a dangerous team they, they are I think every league game is it's just so hard to win that, you know, if you don't come mentally ready and, and physically ready, you're, you're not going to win. What's something that might have jumped out to your team that you maybe didn't expect from back-to-back -back road games that you had to grind it out both mentally and physically? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, our team and myself, like we're still getting to know each other in a lot of different areas for sure. Um, I think we know each other's personalities, but, but when you start talking about a team, like how are you going to respond after a, you know, after a loss? Um, and then you have to do it, you know, back to back road games and, and, and a little bit more travel. And, um, like I knew how our Nevada teams were going to respond after a loss. You can pretty much go back and look at the scores after we lost a game. Um, other than the, the way that the season ended last year um, when we had an injury that, that nobody really knew about. But up until that point, um, we had always responded really well. And, and then we get down, you know, in the second half. And with a lot of teams, if you're on the road on the, you know, second game of a, of a two-game back-to-back road, road trip, you're playing two games, uh, and you're down eight or you're down 11 with seven minutes to go. There's a lot of teams that that thing goes up to 17, 18, 19, then maybe you get it back to 12 and the horn goes off and you lose by 12 or 13. Um, this group believes they can win no matter what the score is. And probably the thing that I'm most proud of is I don't think they're up their scoreboard watching, so to speak, and and looking at, at, the, at the game score, I think they just play. And they play hard, and they just keep coming at you, and they try to get defensive stops. And when shots don't fall, we, get, we fall behind a little bit. But eventually, you know, when shots do fall, we're pretty good because of how we defend. So I was proud of – it's a long answer to a short question. Thought there might have been a little tired with back-to-back -back road games. Do you adjust the practice schedule all this week? No, because now you know we don't have to travel. I think last week we adjusted a little bit, but we uh, we got to have a good practice today, and we got to have a good practice tomorrow. Um, so I, I mean, I think last week maybe you know adjusted a little bit more because the two flights involved, you know, between those games coming home and then going back out. But with no flights, you know, I think we'll be able – we have more time now. We're not getting rushed to get on a plane. How important, how, how important do you think it is that the backup five or four um, starts contributing more in terms of rebounding, scoring, the whole thing? How important is that for you guys? Yeah, I mean, like when I think about our backup four, our backup five, it's it's a group of guys. It's – it's obviously Reggie, it's Scylla, um, it's Ethan, and it's J5. <laughs> I mean, 
because we've proven through the course of three league games that, you know, there might be nights that we play five guards. And so whether it's probably Jimmy Witt's actually probably our center, not, not J5, but J5 is one of the guys when you look down the bench that you choose to go in. And, um, you know, probably be every game we play this year, there'll probably be a stretch where there's five guards out there and we just wing it and see how it goes. And then if it doesn't go good, we'll get them out as quick as possible. And if it goes well and there's some matchups that we can take advantage of, we'll leave them out there a little longer. The game, the commentators mentioned on the conditioning of the players, of going back and forth and so on. What is it that you incorporated from your NBA experience to them to keep them in, sub, in such top shape? Yeah, I think uh, another long-winded thought process. Uh, when, when's practice start, Mike? Okay, you got seven and a half minutes. Um, when I, you know, when I was an assistant in college um, at LSU and Arizona State, I felt like we had 13 players that were eligible to play every night. And I kept saying to myself, why? Because after every game, even when we won, there's like four guys unhappy because they weren't playing or their parents were unhappy or their AAU. And so it was great to sit back as an assistant and observe and I'm used to a 48-minute game, 82 games, travel, getting into the hotel at 2.30 in the morning, waking up, playing a game, playing another game, playing another game, playing four games in six nights. You need depth in the NBA. You play 82 games. In college, you play 30 games. We don't have any 35-year-old players that have played 12 or 13 years in the NBA that are icing their knees night after night after night. And so I thought depth was way overrated in college. And I didn't like walking into a locker room and having guys not be happy with their minutes. So I came up with the formula. I wanted four guys sitting out, or I wanted four scholarships where guys were either redshirting, sitting out due to transfers, or open scholarships. And that way, I felt like you could control your team chemistry in the locker room. That's above the conditioning standpoint. Then you get to your conditioning standpoint, and now you got to get with your staff and say, hey, we got four dudes sitting out. Now we've got to be the best conditioned team. And I think our limited roster size over the five years that I've been in college has worked to our benefit so much. I watch these teams play night after night after night. And they play us, and they start playing more people. And I saw it non-conference, and I'm starting to see it. Con and they start playing more people because they think they're going to wear us down. You're not going to wear us down. We've worked too hard in the summer. And the other thing, too, is our guys can play through mistakes because I'm handcuffed. I, can't, I don't have a bunch of guys to throw in the game. So if our, one of our guys misses a defensive assignment or misses a jump shot, he stays in the game. And so you play with a little bit more mental freedom, I guess. Thank you. It's pretty long. Thanks.